Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful, so thankful for the opportunity that you've given us, the privilege that we have to feast upon your word and to fellowship together over the truth of the word and the gospel of Christ. And I just ask that you would filter out any foolishness, any error, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to begin this, uh, this study, this video. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse. I want to begin by reading a passage from Acts chapter 18. The first 11 verses of Acts chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and he wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and he said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue, and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now in our last study together, we had started looking at the ninth and the tenth verses of chapter 10. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. A fundamental truth in Christianity is that man had absolutely nothing to do with his redemption. This, I know, comes as a shock to many of you people. That God has a family that are his own. He calls them sheep versus goats. He calls them we versus them. He calls them the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. And those two families are consistently portrayed in the Word of God. And it's a basic, fundamental of Christianity that personal faith follows redemption. If you've been following along in this study through Romans in the previous chapters up, up until now, this is what you have seen. It does not precede it. And because that basic fundamental truth is missed by much of modern Christianity, we have essentially a false gospel being taught that man is responsible for his new birth and that man is responsible for his redemption. The consistent Christian testimony, the biblical testimony, is that you're born from above by the will of God, not by the will of man, not by the will of the flesh, but by the will of God. And I've spent a lot of time trying to point out another important biblical truth, and that is that the concept of salvation follows redemption. The concept of personal faith in Christ follows the fact that you were born from above by the will of God and that you are his child. When that is confused, then the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ is diminished and the flesh is exalted. Now, this has happened several times in the history 
of the church in Acts. In chapter 15, there were certain Judaizers who rose and preached that unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. And I, I don't know what they were thinking and suggesting that one had to be circumcised to do anything to gain merit with God. Biblically, salvation is not the first step in a Christian's experience. The first step is that he's God's child, chosen from before the foundation of the world, born from above, by the will of God, and redeemed by the obedience of Christ, reconciled by the death of Christ, Salvation comes in after these basic tenets of doctrinal truth. In Acts chapter 18, we read where God said to Paul, I have many people in Corinth that are mine. Now, do you suppose what Paul ought to do is go into Corinth and try to exhort people to accept Christ so they could go to heaven? Because if they didn't, they'd go to hell. He's already been assured by God that God has his own in Corinth. What do you think his message ought to be? His message is the word of God. The good news is not that you ought to do something to be born again. The good news is you're God's child. Understand what he's done for you in Christ. This is God's Word, and what Paul preached in Corinth was the Word of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to the Jews in Matthew 13, he said, There were many righteous people who desired to see and to know the things that you see and know, and they didn't, but they were righteous. They didn't know about Christ. They didn't know about the message that he was preaching to those people. But God called them righteous, and we have the word of God to declare that God will not call someone righteous who's not righteous. Neither will he call something evil that is not evil. God is truthful. In Romans 5.19, they were made sinners by the disobedience of Adam. No synergism there. Not a single one of you, not a single one of you, was made a sinner because of anything you did. You were made sinners because of the disobedience of Adam, and in like manner, in exactly the same way, you were made righteous in Christ. Nothing you did, you were made righteous in Christ. You may not be saved. You may not be delivered from works and from fear of death and a thousand other things from which you are delivered by the finished work of Christ, but you are righteous you're made righteous because Christ obeyed, not because you obeyed. In 1 Corinthians 1, we were told that Jesus Christ was made unto us righteousness. We are told in 2 Corinthians that he who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Why are we made the righteousness of God in him? Because he was made sin for us. I've spent some considerable time trying to direct your thinking into the almost unbelievable concept that our new creation, which was born by the will of God, was created in righteousness. Now, once you get the concept that the new creation cannot sin, then you understand how that a good tree can't bring forth any fruit. Neither can a bad tree bring forth good fruit. In 1 John 3, that which is born of God cannot sin. It isn't that you people don't sin, but your new creation does not sin. It cannot sin because his seed abides in us and it cannot sin. Folks, listen to me. We were made a new creation in Christ. We had to be. Christ could not come and dwell inside a, a, a physical uh, body or a, a, a living person that was had a, a single nature. Just, you know, we're not a, a one-natured individual. We're a two-natured individual. 
That comes out clearly in Romans chapter 7. We see with the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. We were made a new creation in, in order that there would be a place where Christ, who knew no sin, who can't be touched by sin, can abide in us. He just he couldn't abide in the old nature. And so therefore, the new nature is sinless. This is a wonderful truth. It's a truth that few Christians seem to grasp. Much of the personal contact that, that I have with others who profess to be Christians is the burden of sin that they carry. Oh, Steve, you don't know what I did. If I hadn't done that, God could have used me in a great way. You've got to be kidding. You are a new creation by the will of God, born from above, created in true righteousness and holiness, made righteous by the obedience of Christ. You stand before him without spot and without blemish. And you're telling me that God can't use you? We're told in Colossians that the reason we are holy and unblameable in his sight is because he died for us. I believe it is a basic biblical principle to say that God died individually for us. We're talking about substitution here. Christ died individually for us. I don't believe he died for you to, to give you the, he didn't die to give you the option whether or not to take advantage of that. He died in your place, folks. We are told in the scriptures that we were in him when he died, we were in him when he was buried, and we were in him when he rose from the dead. Now, in fact, I could even go further and point to scriptures that show that, that when he ascended, we ascended with him because we are co-seated with him in the heavenlies. It's almost a ludicrous concept to suggest that Jesus Christ died for somebody who is or, or could be going to hell. And if you knew, and you do, that God has many of his own people in Corinth, that he has many of his own people in your Corinth, what would you preach? What would you preach? Surely you wouldn't go and preach that you could become a child of God if you wanted to. The choice is yours. God's left the decision up to you whether you go to heaven or hell. We're born again by the will of the flesh. Surely that's not what you preach. That's all modern evangelism. That is not what Paul preached in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 15, we have the Holy Spirit telling us what he had Paul preach. Moreover, brethren, listen to who he's talking to here. I declare unto you the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he died for our sins. Not everybody's, ours. That he was buried and that he rose again. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and where, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. They received the gospel. And immediately, people look at that and they say, See there, Steve, you got to receive it. And of course, that has no bearing at all on the meaning of the word receive. Because, well, you can also cough in my face where I receive the flu. There are any number of illustrations where there's no freedom of the will. You received it. It isn't that you received it because you accepted it. The text doesn't say that. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You received life when he gave you life. He didn't give you something that you could not receive because you were his. You received life when you were born. Your parents got together and you were born as a baby and you received life. It isn't something that you consciously did. This is the gospel. Birth is the illustration scripture uses that God chose to use to drive this point home. The good news is that you received it and you stand in it and you could be saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. You're already God's children. 
And these Corinthians already stand in the righteousness of Christ, and in that same truth, they could be saved if they keep in memory what Paul preached unto them, unless they believed in vain. For I delivered unto you that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He died for my sins according to the Scriptures. He died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day and in, and in Romans 6, I was raised with him. That's the good news. That's the gospel and they stand in that and they could be saved, delivered, if they believe it and receive it. And you were most likely taught that this was some invitation by Paul to unredeemed people. It is not. And that, my friends, is where modern evangelism has gone astray from the very truth of the gospel by which we are saved. They have made it all about what man must do rather than on what Christ did, pushing man up and God down. Back to Romans 10. Are we to adopt the concept that if you confess with your mouth and if you believe in your heart, you'll go to heaven? That isn't what it says. It doesn't say that if you do that, you'll be born again. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you'd be made righteous. It doesn't say you're reconciled. What it says is, what it says is that you'll be delivered. And I spent some time on the concept of salvation versus redemption. It's a wonderful thing to realize what God has done for us in Christ. The most marvelous thing is he's delivered us from the law, from human effort. Heaven's glory does not depend on your production. I think that's fabulous. Hordes of Christians despise me for thinking that. All I'm trying to point out is that the word saved in this verse and salvation in the 10th verse do not mean new birth. They do they do not mean righteousness. They, they don't mean reconciled. They mean delivered. That's what they mean. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Note that the concept of salvation appears in both verses. Imagine a Jew confessing that Jesus of Nazareth, a man born in Bethlehem of, of Judea, a carpenter in Nazareth, is Jehovah God, where he is here declared to be God Almighty, Jehovah of the Old Testament, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that holds it together, all together, the one who gave the law at Mount Sinai, being the one who died in your place. He's the one who not only gave the law, but fulfilled the law. And the text is saying that this Jesus is the almighty, eternal God incarnate, our kinsman redeemer, the one who came to redeem us and to fulfill the law, which demanded an innocent death for the guilty. That's not the Jesus of the Jehovah's. That's not the Jesus of the Mormons. That's not the Jesus of the Muslims. It's the Jesus of Scripture. And though you may be soundly criticized for even suggesting that your way is the right way, the right way is Christ. I don't know about your theology, but the right way and the only way is the Lord God Almighty incarnate, our kinsman redeemer who took our guilt and bore it on Calvary's cross. And so the depth of theology and the very phrase of the ninth verse is tremendous. And I don't know how many times I've had people say, well, I don't like all this theology stuff. I just think it's accept Christ as your Savior and realize He loves you. And What Christ? The minute you mention the name Christ or, or the minute you mention the name Jesus, you open a theological discipline that needs to be understood. The word in our present text is confess. The minute you say the same thing God says, the word confess is homologeo, to say the same thing. That's what the word means, to say the same thing. The scriptures declare that the, the Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem of Judea, is God Almighty, nobody else. 
I tell you that modern Christianity today is fraught with those who do not believe that Jesus Christ was God of very God. And the text shows that we need to recognize that Jesus is who he is and believe in your heart, the center of your being, that God raised him from the dead and thou shalt be redeemed. No, no, no. That thou shalt be saved. We're redeemed by the truth of the gospel, but it is that same gospel that saves us. God's people, his elect, those who are redeemed, are saved, delivered, by the truth of the gospel itself. The gospel, the good news, did not cease being a, a necessary part of God's redemptive plan for us at, you know, when we were born again. The gospel is that through which we are saved. When we're born again, we're not through with the gospel, and the gospel's not through with us. As if it kind of, you know, like, like it served its purpose and, you know, in our lives and somehow winds up on the shelf or that we then move on to some post-conversion life of trying to make ourselves worthy of it. That's law. If Jesus Christ died in your place, and if you rose from the dead so that God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied, what's left to be done? The scriptures declare that you are complete in Christ. How is that so? Because he did it all, and his resurrection from the dead is the testimony of that truth. And Christians today think that just can't be enough. Being complete in Christ is not enough when this is the truth that caused Moses to choose to be with Christ rather than the riches of Pharaoh's household. Moses knew that through the testimony of the law that the innocent paid the price for the guilty, that the, the lamb hadn't done anything. Surely every Jewish boy must have questioned his father Dad, what's, what'd the lamb do? It's a pet. Surely these questions must have come up in a Jewish family. That lamb didn't do anything, but God provided a sacrifice. Why isn't believing in the heart that God hath raised him from the dead enough? Why do we have to confess with thy mouth? The reason is, and I can't give you any better reason, the, the, the following verse tells us, With the heart man believes toward righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto deliverance. So apparently it's important that that, that that part of us that speaks agrees with God that Jesus Christ is sufficient. For with the heart man believes toward the righteousness that was provided in Christ Jesus in the center of the being, and the mouth says, Yes, I believe that. The Holy Spirit has linked them together. Now the interesting thing about verse 10 is that both believe and confess is in the passive voice. And in much of our modern teaching, we make believing and confessing an active voice. We initiated it. That, that's a passive voice. It is a present passive. God is doing it. For with the heart man is believing or made to believe, that's what it says, Man is made to believe toward righteousness, and with the mouth, man is made to confess towards salvation or deliverance. That is what the grammar states, and I didn't construct the grammar. I'm just not that smart. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Hopefully, we're all going home soon. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.